The thermohaline flow is particularly interesting. In the North Atlantic, the, uh, the surface water runs north, uh, getting colder and saltier as it goes because it evaporates. Both of those effects make it denser. <clears throat> and a few hundred kilometers south of Greenland, it gets too dense to float and it sinks. The earth, the water that sinks there will not emerge on the surface again for a thousand years. But it does run down, uh, uh, down around uh, South America into the Indian Ocean and into the Pacific Ocean where it emerges ev eventually and comes around. And this offshoots of the thermohaline flow warm uh, Europe and warm uh, Western United States. And so without the thermohaline flow, uh, we would actually have global cooling. But by far the most important effect of all of these is the greenhouse effect. The greenhouse effect uh, occurs because, um, well, the, the, the solar flux, the flux of energy from the sun amounts to 343 watts per square meter, averaged over the entire surface of the, uh, of the planet over, the, over a year. Uh, the atmosphere of the planet, the oxygen and nitrogen in, in the atmosphere is, is transparent to, uh, to that white hot radiation and it comes right through. But um, uh, when, the, when the Earth tries to radiate the energy back out into space, it radiates it not at, the, not at white hot, but in the, deep in the infrared at much lower frequency. <laughs> and <clears throat> at those frequencies, there are trace gases in the atmosphere that absorb the energy. Those trace gases are water vapor, methane, carbon dioxide, and so on. And those are the so-called greenhouse gases. Before we started fiddling with the atmosphere, before we started uh, burning fuel, that is to say in the 18th century, we had an 88% greenhouse effect. That is to say 88% of the energy radiated by the Earth was intercepted by the atmosphere and re-radiated either out of the space or back down to the Earth. Uh, Re-radiating the energy back down to the Earth, warms the Earth above the temperature that it would have, 255 kelvins, up to 287 kelvins, or 14 degrees Celsius, or 55 to or 57 degrees Fahrenheit. And at that comfortable temperature, we evolved, climbed down from the trees, and started building steam engines. When you think about the greenhouse effect, uh, there are all kinds of feedback effects going on. For example, uh, the, the global warming caused by carbon dioxide in the atmosphere causes the polar caps to melt a little bit. The melting of the polar caps makes the Earth less reflective, so the Earth absorbs more energy from the sun, so it gets hotter still. So that's a positive feedback effect. On the other hand, <clears throat> the melting of the polar caps freshens the northern waters, that is to say they become less salty, and that could have the effect of reversing the thermohaline flow. Uh, people believe that the thermohaline flow might reverse very soon because of the uh, melting of the polar caps. And that would lead to global cooling. So uh, these are very complicated effects and too complicated for, a, for me, a physicist like me. Uh, I, I don't know enough to, uh, to deal with such complications. So we, we like to deal with limiting cases. Uh, two limiting cases are particularly interesting. One of them is if you stripped away all the greenhouse gases from the atmosphere, uh, then the temperature of the Earth would immediately fall to 255 kelvins or zero degrees Fahrenheit. But that's not the end of it because uh, at that temperature, the, all the water uh, of the Earth would freeze and the Earth would become much shinier and more reflective than it is and the Earth's temperature would fall further still. The geologists believe that, uh, that the Earth went through periods like that deep in its history, perhaps a billion years ago, uh, went through snowball Earth uh, periods. The other possibility is 100% greenhouse effect. Suppose we were to increase the 88% pre-industrial greenhouse effect to 100%. What would happen then? We don't know exactly, but we have a pretty good model to look at in planet Venus. Uh, Venus is a little bit closer to the sun, so it should be a little bit warmer than the Earth, but that's a very weak effect. It's not, it's not very strong. <clears throat> and so it's possible that Venus could be very Earth-like in temperature, but we know that it isn't. The Russians dropped a, a, a satellite to the surface and found the surface temperature hotter than molten lead. So Venus is uh, uh, an inferno, and the Earth could be uh, a snowball, or it could be a Venusian inferno, but it isn't either one of those. It's this balmy garden planet that we inherited, it, and we're not doing the right thing by. 
This shows uh, the uh, greenhouse gases and the temperature taken from Vostok Earth, uh, ice cores over 400,000 years. Uh, the top curve in blue is the uh, carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere in parts per billion. <clears throat> the bottom curve in green is the methane concentration in the atmosphere in parts, uh, in parts per billion. And the central curve in red is the temperature of the Earth uh, in degrees uh, Celsius on the left-hand uh, axis. And you can see that they all track very well. That is to say, the Earth's temperature follows the greenhouse gas, gases uh, in the atmosphere. What this, oh, and the, the uh, temperature settled down to uh, near its high end about 10,000 years ago, and it's been there ever since. Uh, what this graph does not show is what happened in the past 100 years, because it can't show uh, on, on, the, on its scale. Uh, what happened in the past 100 years is that the, the uh, concentration of carbon dioxide has gone up to 380 parts per million. That is a 30% increase. The methane concentration is just about doubled. And if the Earth's temperature follows those trends, the results will be catastrophic indeed. Uh, we are doing an uncontrolled experiment with the climate of the only planet that we have. Uh, it is a very foolish thing to be doing. So, uh, what, what, what do we use energy for? Well, before 1800, um, the energy that we got, we, we got came as light, all, all the energy that we got came as light from the sun, and we used it as it arrived. Uh, coal was known to exist, and little bits of it were used in inconsequential amounts. Uh, oil seeps were, uh, were, were known to exist in bits of oil we used from uh, time to time. Uh, swamp gas was analyzed in around 1800 by Alessandro Volta, an, an Italian scientist, to be methane. And methane is the principal component of natural gas. So in some sense, coal, oil, and natural gas, the three fossil fuels were all known, but they were very little used. Then, uh, in the 19th century, things changed. First of all, uh, in 1765, a young uh, mechanic named James Watt was fooling around with a steam engine and thought of a better way to build a steam engine. And James Watt's better steam engine kicked off the Industrial Revolution. Uh, by the turn of the century, steam engines, uh, steam locomotives, uh, were, uh, steam railroads were being built uh, on the land, and that created a tremendous need for coal. Uh, it, it also created stable roadbeds over which coal could be delivered over, for many miles. So uh, coal became a dominant form of uh, fuel in the economy. Uh, there was a need for better uh, urban lighting at night. Whale oil was used for that purpose to a certain extent, but then by the middle of the century, whales were pretty pretty uh, uh, scarce, and something else was needed. And Edwin Drake drilled the world's first oil well uh, near Titusville in northwestern Pennsylvania in the year 1859, uh, and he struck oil. At first, the oil was used for illumination and lubrication, <clears throat> but in 1861, Nicholas Otto, a German entrepreneur, invented the world's first gasoline burning engine and soon oil was in great demand for fuel, and we started drilling all over the world. Uh, the net result of that is that 150 years later, we can no longer live on light as it comes from the sun. Uh, we are thoroughly addicted to oil. <clears throat>